Welcome everyone to this Career Pathways event focused on careers in federal agencies. I'm Wee Youssef and I am director of the Career Pathways program here at ODU. Career Pathways is a university-wide career and professional development program for graduate students and postdoctoral scholars. I encourage you to learn more about the Career Pathways program and consider participating in the Preparing Future Faculty and Preparing Future Professionals certificate program here at ODU. I'd like to go straight into the program and I want to thank my colleague Liz Smith um, with the Graduate School for organizing this workshop. Um, before we start, I do want to let everybody know that the event is being recorded and will be shared via our Career Pathways YouTube channel. Please make sure to mute yourself and use the chat function uh, to ask your questions of the panelists. Um, I will pose these questions to our panelists from the chat. Uh, from the questions that you post in the chat. And also just while we're getting started, if you could please share uh, the graduate program that you're coming from so that we have an idea who's joining us um, in this workshop today. And Liz, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome everybody. We're really glad to have you. I've been planning this panel for a little over two years. <laughs> we were, we had all kinds of great, um, ideas for how to do this in the Hampton Newport newsroom and do kind of a speed networking sort of a thing. And, oh, it was just going to be awesome. But here we are <laughs> in our little boxes. So I'm really uh, so grateful to our panelists for for hanging in there with me. And uh, I'm going to. Uh, and so please do put your um, questions in the chat and uh, and we will try to get to as many as we can. So our panelists today are, I'll just uh, tell you their names and their titles, and then we're gonna let them give a broader introduction of their role in their um, agency or company and um, their pathway. First panelist, and I'll do this in alphabetical order, Jennifer Cunningham uh, works with the Department of Defense as a defense consultant with Booz Allen Hamilton. She is an ODU alumna. Uh, Mr. Bob, uh, that's Dr. Jennifer Cunningham. Mr. Bob uh, Heitzenrether is with uh, NOAA's national, which is no the na sorry, is with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He's a uh, an engineer, an ocean engineer in the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, which is here in Chesapeake, Virginia. Ms. Allison Huell is an admin specialist for the FBI Norfolk office, and she is also the national chair of the FBI's American Indian and Alaska Native Advisory Committee. And Dr. Erica Reed, directs the Office of Science, Education, and Diversity for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So what we've asked is for each panelist to give a, just a brief overview of their role, their agency, their role, and, um, and then and we'll just jump right into questions. So you're up first then, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you so much, Liz. So. Um, as introduced, I'm a defense consultant with Booz Allen Hamilton. I've been with the firm for about five and a half years. Uh, my principal client is the Department of Defense. Uh, I've supported uh, clients with security cooperation planning, security cooperation with allies and partners uh, in the Northern Virginia area, as well as in Germany. Um, prior to that, I was a graduate student at Old Dominion University in their graduate program in international studies. Uh, both their PhD program as well as their master's program. Uh, prior to that, I was both a, a Navy uh, surface warfare officer as well as a military spouse, uh, moving around quite a bit <laughs> before I was able to uh, settle down in one place and, and go to graduate school. Uh, and I'm originally from uh, Houston, Texas. So very pleased uh, to be here with you today and uh, excited to answer any questions I can about the working for the Department of Defense and different opportunities there, uh, as well as uh, opportunities within the private sector um, through defense consulting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob Heitzenrether with NOAA. Hi, so as Liz mentioned, I'm with the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, commonly referred to as co-ops. Our office is responsible for 
development and maintenance of a large portion of NOAA's nearshore coastal ocean observatory network that consists of over 400 stations that provide real-time observations of various physical oceanographic meteorological parameters. Big component of that is the National Water Level Observing Network. So a lot of folks have heard about the tide gauges and weather stations along the coast. And I'm in the engineering division in, a, in an R&D group that does uh, development, test, and evaluation of new measurement systems and sensors. So we go out and find new technology, new sensors uh, that can benefit the network and make sure we're measuring as accurately and efficiently as possible. And our group does all the development um, from the early testing to the transition to operations. Uh, so my background is in applied math and physical oceanography, and I got into the, ocean, the engineering aspect a little later. So I started out with a uh, bachelor's in applied math. I worked as a software engineer for a little while at Lockheed Martin. I went back to graduate school uh, full-time at the University of Delaware's uh, Graduate College of Marine Studies. And I got a degree in physical ocean science and engineering. So it was kind of a hybrid of physical oceanography and engineering. Started out at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab for a few years. I did a lot of uh, Navy sponsored work. I was a physical oceanographer. So I would go out on some uh, deep ocean uh, cruises and we would test new Navy technology. I was with the group that did all the physical oceanographic measurements to support that. And then after a few years of that, I decided I wanted to um, try something new, get out of defense and get into public service. And I was always a customer of NOAA's products, uh, always a user for most of my life. So I thought it would be interesting to get into the long-term ocean observing. So uh, I transitioned uh, over to co-ops and I'm just passing my 14th year here in the same position in the, in the engineering development group. And since I made that change, um, again, the, the background of physical oceanography is very helpful, but I've, I've been more on the engineering development and uh, it's been a, a good experience and I enjoy working at the uh, field office here in Chesapeake. Great, thank you. Allison Yule with the FBI. Hi, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, um, Allison Uwell. I'm an uh, FBI administrative specialist at the Norfolk Field Office. Um, I'm also, um, I actually, I was the, I just recently transitioned to, um, so now I'm the former chair of the American Indian Alaska Native Advisory Committee. It just recently happened. Um, and um, so I actually graduated from um, Old Dominion University. <gasps> Um, with a bachelor's of science and biology okay. and a minor in religious studies and studio art. Cool. Um, and then I transitioned um, going to um, Delta Airlines for a little bit and then getting to my current, um, currently with the FBI in 2016 as an HR specialist, uh, where I worked in recruitment matters up in Clarksburg, West Virginia. And from there in 2018, I got I transitioned over to the Norfolk field office um, to help out with the HR matters there. Um, in addition to my HR duties, I also am the backup public affairs specialist, uh, the honors internship coordinator, the wounded warrior internship coordinator, and the one um, new hire orientation coordinator as well at the office. Okay, so Ms. Uhl is the one you want to talk to. She is the HR person. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Erica Reed. Good Hi, afternoon. welcome. Thank you. Um, good to be here. So again, my name is Erica Reed, and I um, I'm representing the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. It's a part of the National Institutes of Health, which I'm, I, hopefully you all have heard of um, by now. Um, we are one of 27 institutes and centers that make up the NIH. Um, Big NIH, as we call it, is in Bethesda, Maryland, um, where most of the ICs, uh, ICs reside. Um, NIEHS, however, is in North Carolina, um, what's known as Research Triangle Park. Um, and if you're not familiar with that term, it's primarily where Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill meet. Um, so we are biomedical research. Um, we fund, I won't say all of it, but quite a bit of it. Um, and NIEHS, our focus is environmental health science. The other ICs focus on various things. Um, you may have heard of the National uh, Eye Institute, for example, or the National Cancer Institute, um, the National Institute of Infectious um, and Allergy Diseases. That's uh, Anthony Fauci house, as we say. Um, but we all have different focus areas, but it's all biomedical science and biomedical research. 
Um, my office primarily focuses on um, science education and university outreach. So we work with K through 12 colleges and universities, science museums um, like that. We also work very closely with the Institute senior leadership around diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility issues. Um, as far as my path, so my undergraduate degree is in psychology, the master's is in counselor, um, counseling and education, and then the PhD is educational psychology. So I, I'm different from most people at NIVHS, but as an educational psychologist who spent the first half of her career, I don't know why I'm going to third person, but I spent the first half of my career in um, higher education designing um, programs, developing programs, facilitating um, that sort of thing. Um, so the position while I was working on my PhD, um, which is from Georgia State University, the position became available. Um, I applied for it and um, my, my background really fed into what they were looking for. Um, I've always focused on STEM primarily, um, non-traditional careers, um, people of color in these non-traditional careers and STEM of course is part of that um, so it's, I've kind of gone from a focus on engineering to behavioral neuroscience to HVAC design and engineering and now environmental health science. Um, and with NIHS, we're mainly focusing on toxins in the environment and how they impact human health and human disease. I think that's good. That's great. <laughs> and uh, David Borg Borges, Borges. Uh, yes, from indeed. Thank you from NASA is, is with us. So give us your intro, please. Welcome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So hi, all. I am Dave Borges. I'm a physical scientist and associate program manager for the NASA Applied Sciences Disasters Program. So uh, <clears throat> our Applied Sciences Program sits within Earth Science. So uh, while NASA, I am not the part of NASA that is uh, finding new and creative ways to get to the moon and to Mars. Uh, Earth science is looking back on our own Earth and leveraging NASA investments in science expertise um, to address uh, and, and, and uh, support societal benefit areas uh, across uh, our own planet. And within that context, uh, I, I lead our efforts on, in our disasters program. So essentially, we interact closely on a domestic level, um, both federally and at a state level with agencies such as FEMA as well as state level um, departments of emergency management, as well as uh, uh, globally. So with uh, other nations, civil protection agencies, as well as a variety uh, of different organizations across the UN United Nations um, structure to leverage and expose NASA science and expertise to inform uh, better disaster response and disaster management. So everything from uh, mapping volcanic plumes to to uh, to flood extent mapping when hur hurricanes and tropical cyclones landfall both in our own country and uh, and across the world. Um, I uh, am also a, a proud ODU alum, uh, undergraduate in 2010 with uh, with an undergrad in, in geogra geographic information science. That's that's my background. Um, it's, uh, essentially, geospatial analytics. And I'm in fact a, an active graduate student as well with ODU uh, in the, the data science and analytics master's degree program with the emphasis in, in geospatial analytics as well. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's been wonderful so far, highly relevant. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. So look forward to contributing. Thank you. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm smiling because that's um, a brand new concentration in a relatively new master's program. Um, Dr. Tom Allen, and you might be the first student in that program. It's uh, high, highly applicable yeah. and, and very and very excited about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so uh, so students who are with us, please put your questions in the chat, um, and I'm hoping we'll have time to get to as many of them as possible. And I will start with the first question, and I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Reed, and go backwards uh, in reverse alphabetical order. Oh, I, got, I had that wrong, because actually, Allison, maybe I'll start with you first, because you actually are a you. So the question is, how has your training and education and your educational background helped you in the position that you're in and in getting other 
uh, perhaps earlier position. So, um, Allison. Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, um, I got recruited by the FBI actually at an ODU, um, like a meet and greet session that oh, happened. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So I, I actually got an interview and then the, the next day a, a job offer from that. And um, so my education uh, de definitely helped in that aspect. Um, so the qualify for the HR specialist role that I ended up getting picked for, uh, they, they, I, um, I had needed a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 GPA, which in terms from my education at ODU, I had that for that role. And uh, I was able to qualify based on that just alone, um, just my education alone, no experience or anything like that. Okay. So that was really helpful. And um, also in addition, my education um, with, with ODU helped with, I've already having that experience of report making and um, collaboration, teamwork, and uh, working independently as well. So um, all that, that kind of, ex that, uh, I guess you could say the FBI's core competencies, I was kind of already kind of working on that throughout my educational uh, background. Um, so when I got in into the FBI, I was well prepared for the expectations of the work environment there. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reed. Um, so I think I, I touched on it a little bit um, in my intro, but um, so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm different from a lot of people at NIEHS because my background is in psychology and not in one of the life sciences, but environmental health science is highly interdisciplinary. Um, and what I normally express to those who are interested is that what we do at NIEHS, there are those that do the science and then there are those that support the science. And with my background in educational psychology and developing programs, science education types of programs, as well as diversity focused programs, it was a good fit for what NIHS was looking for. Um, so I was recruited into position, into the position. It was a, a new office that had been started by that, at the time, the new director of NIHS. And she wanted um, a, a repository, if you will, of the kind of outreach efforts that were being done across the Institute. So basically I came in being very clear about how to design programs and develop an office and launch it in such a way that involved um, bringing the Institute together so that we were all on the same page with our outreach efforts. And then of course, from there building on um, diversity, equity and inclusion so that um, all students, um, the interested public would have access to information and opportunities regarding what was going on at NIEHS, um, as well as um, being able to provide um, some things internally and externally. So for example, you know, I launched the a Speakers Bureau, we do tours and information sessions where the public is welcome into the Institute for a tour and to talk to other, or to talk to scientists and um, young scientists. We have internship programs, we go into the community, um, we go into classrooms, we do hands-on activities, we, you know, if you're interested in judging a science fair, you know, we kind of do all the things. Well, we did until COVID. So most of what we've been doing, we were able to um, convert to virtual platforms. So we continue to do a lot of it, um, just not face-to-face. -face. So basically answering the question, um, the NIH and particularly NIHS, most people can fit there with whatever they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a matter of what you want to do and what you're passionate about. And I know sometimes passion is a little cliche, but believe me when I say people that do the work that we do, um, whether it's doing the science or supporting the science in a particular kind of way, are passionate about the environment and human health. Mm -hmm. It's hard to um, represent passion on a resume that's that you're submitting through USA Jobs, and we'll right. get to that. Um, right. But yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Bob. All right, so first, just something general, and then I'll offer something more specific. So as I mentioned before, I started out with a bachelor's in applied math and went to work as a software engineer for a while. And although I decided that I did not want to pursue a career in some sort of applied math, and I didn't want to be a software engineer, those two um, experiences are very useful and everything I do associated with 
ocean measurement systems, sensors, collecting oceanographic meteorological observations, general knowledge of software, coding, and a background in math has been very helpful. And then more specifically related to what I do here at our field office, um, through graduate school and my work at the Applied Physics Lab, I got a lot of experience with hands-on field oceanography. So actually touching the sensors, uh, deploying the sensors in the ocean, and again, with the software programming the sensors and everything from acoustic Doppler current profilers to salinity temperature depth sensors. Um, that was very, uh, has been very helpful for me here at NOAA, again, in the group that maintains the long-term ocean observing network. So again, applied math, software, and then the hands-on uh, oceanography, all very helpful skills here in NOAA and um, have, have sort of certainly helped me in, in my current position. Uh, how about you, Jen? Thanks, Liz. So we're, there's really kind of three main aspects to, to the work that I do. One is the subject matter expertise. Uh, one is the uh, project management aspect of it. I lead a team of uh, 25 people uh, supporting a contract with the Department of the Air Force. Um, and then the other one is leadership. I lead that team. I, I help not just manage their work, but you know, grow them as professionals. Um, you know, try mentor them, work with them. Uh, you know, to improve their, uh, you know, their well-being and their performance over time. And I would say for the graduate program in international studies. Uh, really helps with the critical thinking skills, um, the uh, writing skills, research analysis. What it didn't help me with was PowerPoint. <laughs> and because my primary client, client is the Department of Defense and DOD runs on PowerPoint, I'm always wishing I took more training in PowerPoint and Slideology. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's just one thing. Um, I would say for leadership, uh, for, for me, I went to a, a, the Naval Academy and the Naval Academy is really developing leaders. That's one of their primary uh, focus areas. So really, I think it's very important um, if you're going to be in a position with a leadership role or you aspire to be a leader over time, actually dedicating time to it. Uh, and the experiences as a naval officer really helped with that as well. Working with different individuals, understanding that people are, are different and have different challenges and bring different challenges to work with them every day and how you manage those things. Uh, to build a really strong and resilient team. I think that's always something that, that anybody can add to their skill set and has value. Uh, and then the project management side, uh, I don't have a PMP. A lot of my colleagues have a PMP. Uh, I've never quite dedicated enough time or set enough time aside for that, uh, but I've taken some courses just to sort of help me uh, work with people who have PMPs and kind of look at things and problem sets through that methodology. Um, so those are really kind of just ways in which different experiences and programs have, have uh, helped me, um, you know, with the work that I do uh, for Booz Allen Hamilton and, and for the DOD. Thank you. And um, David, how has your training and education helped you in the position that you're currently in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've, I think... I'd hesitate to say it, but it's uh, the back, the technical background of uh, geospatial analysis of geospatial analytics is somewhat unique in that it, it is very cross-cutting um, at almost every um, really sector around the world today that probably leverages geospatial analysis in some form or fashion. And so my um, kind of career path and career growth has been a bit all over the place. Um, after graduate, after under, undergraduate graduation from ODU, um, I, I was actually uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton for almost 10 years. And during that time, I think I supported uh, four, probably four different federal clients to include FEMA um, directly developing, um, uh, evolving the National Flood in, um, Insurance Program and the, the Special Flood Hazard Zones, working for the Department of Homeland Security on, on uh, terrorist threat analysis um, and eventually ending up at NASA and working in, in applied, uh, applied disaster applications. Um, a couple of the, maybe I want to emphasize maybe just two things uh, from Bob's point in particular. Um, you cannot have enough uh, technical background in, uh, in programming in, in particular. It's, uh, it's, it also is obviously highly cross-cutting and, and very useful to have in a critical skill to keep sharp as you um, 
kind of climb the, the career ladder as you get deeper into your career. Um, another point that Jennifer made that, that I really agree with, uh, I think, is, is leadership in particular. And you'll be hard pressed, in, at least I found, in, in kind of formal education to, to get hard leadership training. You kind of have to seek it out yourself. There's lots of resources, really great books and stuff like that, but it's been kind of a personal journey for me to try and develop leadership skills um, over the course of my career as well. And moving my final point as well for um, the example of, of PMP, Project Management Professional, um, came up. I, uh, I also strongly agree that they're very valuable um, from the, at least remembering my experience of kind of looking at um, professional degrees. I, I have PMP and I also have what's called a GISP, a Geographic Information Science Professional Certification. Um, they're very, I was very intimidated by them. Uh, kind of looking at them sort of earlier in my career. They looked like a lot of work, a lot of time and effort. Um, they're definitely worth it. I, I highly encourage them. Um, they, they look very good on resumes when you're applying for jobs and they, and they really do um, sort of ingrain in you uh, really useful skills. Thanks. All right, cool. <clears throat> we do you want to um, ask a question from the chat? Um, I will get to the question from the chat. Um, I, there are already two questions. So students in the audience, please feel free to uh, pose additional questions. But since David had brought up uh, the topic of additional credentials, such as certification, the GISP and the PMP, I wanted to ask Allison, are there maybe HR related credentials, additional credentials mm -hmm. or certifications that could be uh, something our students might might consider pursuing or specific skill sets? Um, so for HR, when I got into the role, I had very little knowledge of the HR aspects and they actually immediately um, put me into training. Um, so that was one of the benefits. Um, so I guess one of the downsides of doing some HR training on, on the outside is more private sector. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're going to get some training in HR, that it's, if it, especially if you want to do HR in, in the FBI, is to have it more um, focused on the federal aspects of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that, because there is a lot of differences um, regarding the various HR specialist roles in, in the FBI, there are some um, people at, um, at headquarters that only focus on benefits or only focus on retirement. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the benefits of our, our organization is that we provide that training for you. Um, so as long as you're able to showcase that you have that, uh, first of all, customer service ability, um, that really is a, a great aspect to get into the role of the HR. Um, prior HR experience is great. Um, our prior educational background is, is great. But if you don't have that, uh, we also help you get that experience or that training as well. Thank you. Um, so I am going to go to our first question from from the chat. And here, um, George is asking if you could uh, speak to differences between applying for federal for, to the federal service uh, compared to applying for private firms that support federal agencies or that contract with federal agencies. And uh, I'm going to start with Jen and then go to David and then open it up um, to our other panelists. Um, to, to respond to that question. So, so Jen. Thank you. So um, for federal agencies, I won't speak too much about it, but because I'm certainly no uh, expert and I think we have folks on the line who are, are better at it, but for USA Jobs, um, it's a very specific uh, process with specific requirements that are defined. The timeline some kind, sometimes can take a little bit uh, long. The hiring process can be a little bit uh, long in the communication, um, you may not necessarily hear things. It just depends on the timeline of the, the hiring agency. Um, but uh, for uh, a private firm or, or, or a company, defense consulting company, for example, whether a large business or a small business um, that has a contract with the government, um, usually the positions that are open, there are contractual requirements. Um, for example, how quickly the position needs to be filled, it's usually very aggressive. So on our program, I have 14 business days to fill a position if somebody leaves. Wow. Very quick. And so we're really, we're really moving wow. along between when we post something on LinkedIn 
that we have something something open and when you could be hired and 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 uh, in processing into the the organization to get your defense you know your um you know your government issued laptop or your common access card and all those sorts of things it can be very very quick uh, which is why it's critical if you're you're um, going to be, you know, trying to compete for a position that requires a security clearance, uh, why it's so necessary to have that clearance or at least have the clearance uh, eligibility to be able to compete. Um, but for those resumes, what I'm really looking for is I, I really don't care so much about the format, but there's going to be specific knowledge, skills, and abilities that the government has defined and that again, we're contractually obligated to, to fill. And they're often really very, they're not uh, necessarily negotiable in any sort of way. So a certain number of years of experience, education level, uh, clearance, um, and maybe types of experience. So, you know, I think the key thing to keep in mind as anybody starts this journey um, is that there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not somebody's a, a, a fit for one of those positions, but throwing your hat in the ring and, and applying for something and competing for something, uh, it's a good thing because you're you're going to be screened by a recruiter and, and you might have an interview, which even we take a lot of interviews where we're pretty sure the individuals, it's they're not quite qualified, but um, we, we take the interview because we want to meet the person because there might be an opening uh, either with an R team or another team that does similar work uh, in the future. And we just like meeting good people and we'll pass resumes around and say, hey, we spent some time talking to this individual, highly motivated, just a little bit junior. I mean, everybody has, and we interview a lot of people that are that are overqualified. And what happens when you're overqualified is, is you're usually just too expensive for, for the position because all of these positions are, are it's already been negotiated uh, what the rate the government will pay for that specific position. So again, I, I would just encourage anybody um, who is interested in whatever agency to be flexible in terms of if they really care about that work um, and you know, you know, they want to be a, a government employee at some point, um, just to be more flexible in terms of, of the different pathways they, they take to get there. Um, it's really not unusual for somebody to work for a company uh, and then become a government employee later or vice versa. So there's more mobility across um, the two than I would have expected. But yes, the hiring process can be uh, really very, uh, very different. Um, and happy to elaborate that on that any anymore, but I'll give uh, my colleagues a, a or my fellow panelists a chance to answer as well. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. David? Yeah, I couldn't agree more um, with, with all of Jennifer's comments and just maybe playing off of the, the primary difference um, is with federal, so with USAidjobs.gov, is there's just a structure and you just have to follow the structure and li literally populate boxes, right? Um, private, uh, from, a, from my experience, you, you don't have to do that and you have a lot more freedom um, in terms of kind of how you respond to a job offering. And that's there's a, a lot of opportunity in that. And I kind of, I've thought, I thought for a long time that it was sort of just common knowledge that you should tailor, um, you know, uh, job applications as well as resumes to, to jobs. Um, I see a shocking amount that, that aren't, that are, that are very obviously, you know, just kind of boilerplate and someone might, is probably just submitting them to, you know, a lot of different opportunities. Um, for those, and maybe it's just, you know, in certain cases that's okay, but for, you know, jobs that you are really, you're really going after, um, take the time, take a little bit of extra time, do some due diligence and research on, you know, the firm or the, or the company or whoever it might be and, and tailor your resume and, and, you know, put some thought into it and let those, you know, reviewing your application, make it apparent that you've done some, you know, to, to the extent possible, kind of your homework on that role. Um, it does, it does make a, a difference in my opinion. And of course, you know, when possible, there's, there's lots of cases, yeah, where, you know, something might come up and it's, and that uh, an opening might close in, you know, like 72 hours or something. And then you're constrained by, you know, that, by that obvious constraint, but wherever possible, um, I, I think it really is valuable to invest time in, in tailoring what you're submitting based on available information. All right, um, Erica, Bob, or Allison, anything else to, to add to that? 
just a short comment that I agree completely. Um, you know, that resume and application package, regardless of where it comes from, that's a first impression. And we notice when people take the time to tailor it specifically to um, a position or an, a program office that you know something about. And I also like Jennifer's recommendation to, you know, always throw your name in the hat, even if you're not sure if you're qualified, it, uh, is often a great experience um, just to run through an interview and then also get to know someone. And we've had those exact scenarios where we get a resume that someone might not fit on our team, but we pass it off to another um, team or another program office in NOAA, and that results in, in a hire. So uh, just wanted to emphasize my those, those points made by others. And I'd like to say also, um, so yes, USA Jobs, you're going down the list, you're filling in the boxes, but I would encourage you to do that um, because believe it or not, it's kind of good practice. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see what might get you through the door or what might not get you through the door. Um, and you can see like, what are they asking? Like what is a KSA and how does it apply to what I do or what I know? or what I need to go figure out how to do. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, it could be, it. yes, it can be time consuming, but I think it's um, it, it can also be good practice. Um, and with the, the timeline, you'll see a job that's announced and it's open for five days. Don't let that throw you. I mean, a lot of people will say that it's only five days because they already have somebody in mind. Well, maybe, but in the federal government, a lot of positions, particularly on USA Jobs, you have to compete for. So just because it's only open for five days does not mean that they have somebody already. So, you know, they're just kind of doing what they have to do. And, and the other reason why sometimes a job may be open for just five days is it's a way to not get 500 applications, mm. but, you know, more like 200 applications, depending on what it is. Um, so, you know, that don't let that short window, you know, throw you off. Um, just kind of dig in and look and, you know, set up the profile and that kind of helps figure out those steps as well. Right. Thank you. Oh. Jennifer, do you have anything to add? I was going to pile on to what Erica was saying and, um, you know, anything that you do that helps you understand the market that you're interested in working in. So, you know, whether it's filling out the full, P, uh, you know, USA Jobs uh, profile, reading the job postings, I mean, these are also things that you can, uh, you know, do searches for and follow on LinkedIn. Um, it helps you understand what there's a demand for and the types of, of skills um, that are in demand right now. Um, and it gives you more of a sense of what your options are. And um, so I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's absolutely worth the, the investment in, in time. Thank you. And Allison, I didn't want to uh, shortchange you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so um, what um, the FBI's job postings, they're going to be on um, www.fbijobs.gov um, instead of USA Jobs. Um, so the format's a little bit, I would say, uh, not uh, filling in the boxes um, per se, you, you get to attach your resume there. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with everyone in that you want to tailor your resume based on the job application. Um, so there's, um, if you're trying to qualify based on specialized experience and it shows up there on the, the bullet point list, make sure you can elaborate if they ask you about your PowerPoint experience. Make sure that you document that in your resume and showcase that, that, that you have that one year of experience there. Um, and in addition to um, applying, if you're applying based on solely on your education, you wanna make sure you attach your um, documentation up there. A lot of the times um, that doesn't happen and then you can get, um, you, you, you won't get, get considered because you don't attach those documents. Mm. Um, and um, so the application process is a little bit long when, when you submit your application. Typically the postings are up for two weeks. Um, an HR specialist is actually um, reading your resume. So there's no system that's knocking you out based on keywords or um, the lack of keywords. Um, so there's actually someone who's reading every single one of your resumes. Um, and so that can take between like two to four weeks, depending on how the amount of um, resumes that the HR specialist gets. Um, so just make sure when you're submitting your, your resume that 
um, you have uh, all that exp experience in your resume or that you have your appropriate educational documents in there. And um, one thing to add is since it's a federal resume, um, there is no like set um, length that you have to do. Um, I've had people submit um, a 200 page resume. I would not encourage that, um, but we don't have a limit. Um, so if you have the experience that you wanna document, I say um, typical resumes are between four to five pages, sometimes longer, um, but you wanna make sure that you have everything that you want to document uh, or showcase to us in that, in that resume. Great. Um, so I want to transition to a question, uh, another question um, from the chat asking about um, tips that you would give to humanities graduate students. So we've kind of heard some more specialized um, skills in GIS and, and programming. Uh, what tips would you give humanities graduate students? Erica, could I start with you? Sure. So um as far as nih niehs it will be wholly dependent on the position that you're applying for um, keep in mind that you know the nih is biomedical research and biomedical science but i did mention that there are those who do the science and those that support the science so someone with a humanities background could very well be supporting the science um, so again it depends on what it is you want to do and what kind of jobs would be available um, there are um, jobs and administrative kinds of jobs in our administrative officers that support the work um, in an administrative kind of way, um, then there's a whole host of, um, well, there's a variety of positions. For example, with my, me being a educational psychologist um, and, and understanding what I understand about people and human behavior and um, the, the science behind education, uh, teaching and learning rather. Um, so that, that fits in terms of what I bring to the table and what it is that they need it. So again, it depends on what you want to do. Um, if you're just looking for a job to get started, that's great. Um, as a, uh, a graduate student and soon to be a recent graduate, there are programs um, that NIH sponsors for um, those groups specifically, um, it's called the Pathways Program. So you might wanna check out the website um, and search for it. I, I can't recall the, the, um, the URL right off, but they, these are positions designed for students um, who are current students as well as recent graduates to help you get through the federal door. Um, you would go into the position whether, um, you know, again, it could be a variety of things. It could be, um, working in an office as administrative support or an administrative technician. And there's all kinds of federal titles. So, you know, I might say some of these things and they won't make any sense to you whatsoever, um, but they are support positions primarily uh, where you can rise up in rank, um, you know, from being the support person to being the person that oversees or supervises the support people, for example. Um, but pathways for recent graduates, it's a way through the federal door, you're in the position for a particular length of time, and then you can be converted into a full time permanent federal position where you're not competing with the rest of the world when a position um, comes mm. over. So that's, that's a, a, something to think about and a way um, mm. that you will. Any of my other panelists um, would like to speak to kind of tips for humanities graduate students? Jennifer, go ahead. Sure. So my undergraduate is actually, I was an English major at the Naval Academy. So there are so many science and engineering courses. It's a very STEM heavy curriculum there. So everybody graduates with a Bachelor of Science, uh, but I just needed uh, some balance in my life. So I was an English major. Um, and the best thing about that, of course, is that I'm a strong writer. And, um, and that's very helpful in a DOD environment. I, it's really helpful in any, any environment. But I would say in terms of tips is, is to be very uh, kind of open-minded. You know, if you're trying to do a certain field, there's probably a lot of positions uh, and jobs that are things that you haven't, you couldn't even think of. Um, our team of people is very multidisciplinary. Um, even though we're all in the international affairs, security cooperation space, we're doing things from foreign disclosure 
to uh, you know, weapons systems platform subject matter expertise, which is highly technical, uh, to strategic communication, something that uh, you know, somebody with a public affairs uh, you know, um, or communications background would be better suited for. So I think you know, really realizing that there's a whole world there with just so, so many different types of uh, positions and opportunities um, that you may think uh, there might not be a place for you, but there really is. And I think lastly, um, don't be afraid to add to your tool bag. Um, you know, in addition to being, you know, if you're, you know, an English from the English department and you have, uh, you're a voracious reader and you're got great writing skills, but, you know, don't, don't be shy about, you know, additional, you know, certifications or, or skills that you can add so that, uh, you know, you're bringing uh, more to the table when you apply for a position. Great. Um, so there's another question. Um, from the perspective of someone with a teaching background and you know thinking about the different experiences that you all brought to your careers and your positions um, would these types of skills or from previous experience be considered for example leadership and management and i'll offer this up to bob to to start us out Sure. Um, I have some specific examples of uh, how um, a background with teaching would, would apply to some of the positions here at NOAA. I can't really answer the question about leadership and management. I think it's certainly a possibility. Um, but just some examples here at NOAA, we have some folks with an education background that help us with uh, training curriculums, um, reaching out to partners and supporting partners who want to um, have their own ocean measurement systems, and we come up with tech, technical manuals, um, technical guidelines, and there's also, you know, the, the background in English is great there as well. Um, we, we develop a lot of um, documentation, uh, technical writing related things. So um, in NOAA, again, just um, there are several positions associated with partner support, training, and developing uh, the technical, technical manuals that support um, the ocean observing system. Thank you. That's very reassuring, particularly for someone like me that kind of started out in a degree in engineering and going over to business and then eventually finally in public administration to, to be able to speak to our graduate students about how, you know, all of these different backgrounds and exp experience offer uh, building blocks for always for that next that next step. Any other of our panelists want to speak to to that question about the teaching background? Allison? Um, so with um, a teaching background or um, as a, a prior question regarding English, so uh, all our positions, you can bring in various different um, educational backgrounds and use it in a variety of positions at, at, or at the FBI. So for instance, I could see um, these, if you have that bachelor's, master's, um, going into that special agent role, you can use that as, as in the special agent role. You can use that as a management program analyst or administrative specialist like myself. Um, we have public affairs, uh, community outreach. We have all different types of positions where your education can fit. Um, and again, I agree with that comment about thinking outside the box and not focusing just solely on a specific position because you never know that your education could actually go into a different field. Um, so um, a good example for the special agent role, one of my coworkers, she's a special agent and she was also a former biology teacher. So, um, and she ended up becoming a special agent with that, um, that background. Uh, so that's just something to consider there is that you can use your education and you don't necessarily have to be, you know, not necessarily like stuck in a particular um, position that you're like, so you want to broaden your horizons like for myself for instance um with a biology background and i broadened it up to like hr for instance um so just keep that in mind that it is, as long as you're going through the fbi jobs portal and exploring all the different positions that we have available and we have a lot your 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 education can fit in just about anywhere um of course there's those set positions that like a, an it specialist that might be um you know, of course, there's some educational requirements there, but 
for the most part, you can fit in, in anywhere. Thanks, Allison. Erica. Um, so I was going to say that there sometimes there are opportunities for, um, for example, curriculum development. So, you know, a person comes to the door with a teaching background. We have, many of our scientists were teachers to start. Um, but even without the, the STEM background, if you have a teaching background, there's opportunities to develop and create, create training programs, for example. Um, and so that's definitely something that you can bring to the table. Or if you're looking at a supervisory position in terms of how you work with your staff um, or being a part of that staff, how you help others to better understand what it is you're trying to put forward, you know, on behalf of the institute, on behalf of the office, on behalf of the division um, or the group that you might be um, representing inside of the institute. Um, so yes, teaching is a, a great skill to bring um, to the table because I think it, for some, it helps them to better communicate with others who might not um, fully understand what it is you're trying to put forward. Hopefully that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, and I think it's something that is very important for our students to to recognize um, kind of that that opportunity, those types of opportunities. Um, I would like to go back to one of the comments I think made in the introductions about the importance of passion. And, and Liz has kind of said, yes, we all recognize that passion is important, but how do you translate passion to paper? How does that passion help you make it through uh, that? first cut of the of the review process and I think Erica you are the one that brought up passion so if you don't mind I'm gonna hand this over to you to get us kind of started on kind of that that discussion sure so unfortunately depends on how you look at it with USA jobs it's hard to you know check boxes and show the passion I think Liz you, you kind of mentioned that um, but you do have the opportunity to upload a resume and a cover letter. And, you know, sometimes with these more electronic ways of doing things, you know, that people skip the cover letter. I would highly recommend to not skip the cover letter because that's where you can pour your passion. Um, and there are the traditional and typical kinds of cover letters, and that's fine. But I would also make sure that there is a paragraph in there that speaks loudly to your passion. Um, for people like me, for example, and I don't hire the whole world, but, you know, that's the thing that catches me, you know, I, yeah, I'm going down the list, I see the names, I see the people who qualified, but when I get to those resumes and cover letters, you know, that that's where I start to read and, and pay attention. Now, granted, I am a qualitative researcher by training. That's my thing. It's what I do. I love to hear the voice, um, but I think that's a, a good way to do it. And I'll tell you a secret. If you're applying for a position, um, you might want to try to figure out where that position is coming from inside of that, that or for us, the Institute, um, and send that individual, if you can figure it out, that cover letter expressing your passion. I get them all the time. And I'm like, how did they even know it was me? <laughs> my, my name is not necessarily attached. But you know, you, you can be a little investigative and kind of figure it out sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and sometimes there is a name attached to it or with USA jobs, there is a HR specialist whose name is attached to that announcement. You can always send that passionate letter or statement to that HR specialist and sometimes they will forward it to the selecting official. I know I'm using jargon, but you know that's sometimes that's the way that it works. So even with my interns, I tell them to dig in, find out who you want to work for, send them a letter, an email and tell them why you want to work for them and what you're going to bring to the table. Um, so. From my experience, that's a good way to identify or to express your passion. We like that inside secret. Thank you, that's David. <laughs> Erica, you, you came, we did really, but it kind of spoke to what I was going to say, but I'll maybe maybe frame it in a different way. And that simply is, I, I in a lot of different people that I talk to, I cannot overemphasize the importance that I personally place on um, your individual professional network. And, and up until now, we've just kind of been talking about, you know, responding to, you know, job postings that, you know, you may have that are currently available online, what USA jobs were otherwise. Almost every job that I've, almost every job that I've had has, I, I think, resulted from, you know, active outreach throughout my, you know, professional network, 
of people. And so if you have a patent getting back to, I think, you know, the question was about passion and communicating passion. If you have a passion about something in particular, um, figure out whatever, you know, if it's a particular agency that's brought the federal agency, that's too, that's too broad. But, you know, if a particular program in particular, um, sub element of a program catches your interest, reach out to people, figure out, you know, Google who program managers are, who the different staff are in these different programs and reach out. Um, lots of, you can find people's emails online a lot for, for, you know, government agencies, reach out and express interest. Um, and, it, and, and just something sometimes as simple as, you know, this is that fascinating to me. Do you have time, you know, in the next month or something where we could connect and I could learn more about what you do. Doing things like that establish personal relationships, and they're incredibly important and valuable to to getting in, learning what actual jobs are are out there and, and landing a job that that you really are passionate about and kind of pour yourself into. Anyone else want to add to that? Go sure. ahead, Jen. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking when when Erica was talking about getting the emails, through, she was like, how did they find me? But I'll recommend something very similar. And that's um, in addition to applying for a specific position and our positions will be, uh, it's called a requisition. And a, it's something you could post on LinkedIn, but you, something you go apply to. But I'll say in addition to applying for, you know, here's the hiring manager and writing the hiring manager an email and in the body of the email, you know, a quick introduction. Um, but, you know, something that shows how you meet each of those knowledge, skills and abilities. You're making it very easy to see that you're a good fit for that position. But going that extra step, you know, again, it's just a demonstration that you're, you're very interested and engaged. Um, but, you know, it's not always easy to do that. And and so. Um, you know, we'll, our recruiter will screen individuals and, and uh, set up interviews, and those interviews are really where we get a sense of just the, the individual's engagement, their interest, um, their passion for the work, and, and that's where, you know, we'll, again, even if we know that they're not quite the right fit, maybe they're under or overqualified, um, we want to re-engage re them some way because we know they'd just be such a great fit for the work in general. Uh, and for the field because, because of their passion. That does tend to come through uh, in, our, in an interview setting where you're able to talk to, to somebody. And we try to give in our interviews plenty of time for people to overcome their nerves and get a chance to talk about, you know, why they're specific, you know, why they're interested in, in the work. Because to me, that's a great indicator the person's going to be successful. Uh, they're not going to come to the position knowing everything about the world. None of us do. Uh, but if they're interested, they'll be motivated to learn what they need to learn to be successful. And that's critical. And you can't make somebody be interested <laughs> in what they're doing. They, that needs to come from themselves within. So building off of this discussion, um, I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about informational interviewing. And what we've recently uh, hosted for some of our graduate students is a short workshop on informational interviewing and encouraging our graduate students to conduct an informational interview um, with someone who is in the job that they aspire to or whose career path they admire and they'd like to pursue or to gain some additional insights into a particular position or an organization. Um, so could you maybe as, as our panelists speak to some advice that you might give students who would be interested in contacting somebody like you to conduct an informational interview? Uh, who wants to go first? I'll let Allison start us off. Thank you, Allison. Okay, thanks. Um, so I am actually more than happy to sit, uh, um, you know, do a, uh, like a, Teams call or a phone call um, in person is a little bit harder nowadays to do. Um, but, but prior to COVID, um, we, we I used to do that as well. But I'm more than happy to sit down and um, talk with students regarding not not only my career um, but just the FBI in general and um, other positions as well. And um, I know that my um, applicant coordinator. Um, uh, special agent um, Jennifer Bach um, if you're interested in the special agent role I know she's also passionate about talking about that role as well 
Um, and um, you can actually, um, I can um, put my um, email address in the chat box for anyone who's interested in that. Um, and you can reach me out, reach, contact me um, via that route. Thank you. Bob, some thoughts about informational interviewing and how our students might pursue that? Yeah, again, you know, similar to the previous panelist, I would be happy to facilitate any such um, practice here in NOAA, uh, especially at the, at the Chesapeake field office. So happy to support any requests, but just some general advice. I think um, make sure you know the right person to reach out to. Um, come up with a specific proposal, um, maybe list exactly what you want to know and make sure it's a reasonable time frame. I think most uh, folks will accept that and uh, it should be relatively easy. If, if you have a well-coordinated plan, why are you doing this? Um, here's the information I would like to learn and, and I think we can accomplish it in this time frame. And I think if you're very specific and try to get the right person and even if you don't, um, you know, if, if you're proactive, I'm sure someone would, would help direct you to the right point of contact. Mm -hmm. But again, if there's any specific interest within NOAA and co-ops, I would be glad to facilitate any sort of um, exercise like that. Very cool. Erica. Yes, yeah, so this is something that we do um, with our interns um, and we encourage them to have inter informational interviews with whomever they want to at the Institute. Um, and again, you can go to the website and see who's doing what in the various labs if you're particularly interested um, in, in the science, doing the science, um, but you can also see who some of the um, division leaders are, office leaders, um, uh, so on and so forth. So you can always pick someone and send them the email. Um, and in that email, though, um, you need to be very specific and kind of be clear that this is something that you would like to do with them. Not so much, I'm trying to find people to do something, you know, you, you don't want to approach it that way. You want to be very clear that you want to have a conversation with them and then tell them why, like who you are, why you're interested in the work that they're doing, whether it's doing the science or supporting the science, and that, you know, you, you would love to have a conversation about their um, educational choices, their career path, and then what your particular interest is. Um, that gets their, I, I believe that gets their attention much better than what may feel like kind of a, a template or a boilerplate mm -hmm. sort of ask, um, you know, so, you know, some scientists and others have fairly large egos. So when they have an opportunity to talk about themselves, <laughs> they might take it on. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, the, the information interviews are, are awesome. Um, and like I said, we, we have our interns do it. And before we know it, they have other connections. And it is a part of building that, that network that David talked about. Um, and you might even get a mentor out of it, which you know is a whole other topic. Um, but yeah, I would encourage that. Thank you. I, I see a few hands. So I'm going to go to Jennifer and then Bob. And then David. All right, thank you. Um, so this is the sort of thing that I do all the time now. I wish that I had done it when I was a graduate student. I admit I was um, a little intimidated uh, and I, I felt like really everything needed to be perfect before I talked to anybody about anything. And um, <laughs> I discourage that mindset because most professionals are very happy to spend a little time, uh, you know, talking to somebody, um, you know, from my perspective, um, I meet, I'll meet with somebody, you know, that is just coming uh, out of undergraduate all the way to, you know, military, soon to be military veterans that are retiring after, you know, 30 years of, of military service. And it, from my perspective, I just want to do what I can to demystify the hiring process because I remember being on the outside of it and being very intimidated by it. And it all seemed very opaque. Uh, and I, you know, it, it just was something that made me very uh, nervous. <laughs> and so I, I really try to demystify that. Um, you know, I really wanna give the, the individual an opportunity to ask about, you know, whether it's the company culture or, you know, the battle rhythm of a, working with a particular client and the realities of that. You know, people kind of bring different things to this. Um, some might, might be trying to see if there are possibilities for remote work and how they might balance, uh, you know, this kind of work with, uh, you know, different demands in their in their personal life or other interests. So, 
Um, I, yeah, I highly encourage it. I do agree it's helpful to be specific and not overly open-ended when you reach out to people um, so that they, it's going to be a more meaningful time if you have sort of some specific, specific questions that you're bringing to the table. Uh, and also just being respectful of the individual who's meeting with you with their time. Um, when things get very hectic, uh, sometimes an email, uh, my, the individual might be slow to respond. You might need to send a friendly reminder to put it back on the top of, you know, just don't take those types of things personally. <laughs> um, but I find with uh, when people reach out to, for example, my leadership, when they're, you're getting to the principal and VP level, um, you know, there's just so many more demands on their time. So they absolutely want to talk to people. It just gets a, a little bit more difficult to kind of fit things in. But you know, please don't be discouraged. It's absolutely great to take advantage of, of those resources. Um, I did want to just mention really quickly when it comes to professional network, I had a different idea of what that meant when I was in graduate school than I do now. And I remember my girlfriends and I going to all of these conferences and talking to all of these people and exchanging business cards and none of it ever came to anything. And what's really meaningful is the people that I've worked with that I have a true connection with uh, you know, people that I've been in different spaces with, I was in the Navy with, I was stationed with, uh, you know, I, I either on the government side, we were in the same office, you know, those, those really, you want to build up an authentic network where you have real connections with individuals. And it's, so it's not, you know, uh, and maybe that is because you're going to conferences and you were on a panel, uh, had a great, uh, you were on a panel with somebody and, and really hit it off. Um, but, you know, really, take stock of, you know, who, who are your classmates, you know, who did you really connect with and, uh, and those relationships and continue to invest in those relationships that, uh, you know, maybe they're personal and professional, but that really matter. Cause those are the networks where if I get a recommendation from somebody who knows somebody personally, I'm going to take a lot more stock in that than, you know, uh, just somebody forwarding something that somebody met somebody else one time. So, um, you know, invest in those professional relationships that, that really have meaning, meaning to you. Thanks, Jen. Bob? I just wanted to tack on a quick comment uh, to what I said before. And a few things that Erica said prompted me to remember this. Um, if you're reaching out to someone that's in a field of research science or R&D engineering or any technical field, I suggest that you see if they have any publications, read their publications, let them know you, you read them, reference them, and maybe point out a couple specific things you're interested in. And that also relates back to conveying your passion. Um, if, if you're applying for a job in, in you know, a research science or technical field, read the publications and they bring that up during your interview. Thanks, Bob. David, did you have anything else to add about informational interviews or how would, how would a student kind of capture your attention if they wanted to reach out to you to, to ask if they could schedule a, an informational interview to talk to you about all of this cool GIS stuff or this cool earth science, earth science data. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I, I think everything previously said is, is right on the money. Um, uh, Bob's comments on, on, you know, publications is right or just, uh, you know, where I, I know it depends on different people, but Maybe if you're in a position to see what you know current events might be on top of mind, um, just for for me in particular, would you know as disasters program, you could go and look at our website mm -hmm. and see what some of the recent uh, disasters on a global scale uh, our program has responded to, um, and so maybe maybe taking a current events tack as well. And, and, and getting thoughts on something that's you know, still top of mind with the, the person that you're kind of targeting, trying to um, develop a relationship and learn something from would also be another strategy to take. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass this off to Liz, but I just realized um, that I had overlooked one question in the chat. Um, it was a question about um, cybersecurity or IT opportunities or internships, and if you are aware of any types of opportunities in those areas. Um, yes. <laughs> not, not, not specifically, but but uh, you, you made the right decision, uh, I guess is my answer, because yeah. I don't think you could throw a stone and, and not find an, an opportunity, quite, quite frankly. Right. Jennifer? I mean, you, you, I would, high, yes, this is very high demand. 
Um, you know, I would cast a, a wide net in terms of, you know, whether it's job postings on USA Jobs or, you know, different consulting firms that do that type of work. Um, use LinkedIn, you know, the power of LinkedIn in terms of following different organizations. Um, both government and companies will post when they have a positions opening yeah. and you can kind of jump on it that way. But yeah, absolutely. It's an it's a, it's a important field. It's the demand for it is growing. Uh, and what I've noticed is that there's a lot of, hey, we don't care if you don't have an experience in it, we'll train you, we'll get you. And for veterans, for example, there's a lot of upskilling opportunities through, you know, facilitated by, you know, hiring our heroes in partnership with different companies and federal agencies. So really, I mean, there's a there's a lot of opportunity out there. You just got to start looking for it and following the right, uh, you know, organizations on uh, on LinkedIn. That's what I would recommend. Allison. Uh, so with with the FBI, your the cyber security IT background, you can also go for like, there's um, special agents that are focused in that area. Um, you also have, um, of course, IT um, positions as well, and as well as administrative positions. So each field office has a cyber squad. Um, and at headquarters, we have a cyber division as well. So you could work as a manager management program analyst, IT specialist forensic examiner, um, or um, being a special agent, intelligence analyst, or a staff operations specialist, and be able to work in that um, cyber IT world. Um, and there's a multiple different types of positions that you can go for. Um, and I encourage looking on fbijobs.gov to see all the different types that we have available. Um, it's a, a, a large quantity and I, I would encourage particularly the special agent track. Um, I think that's the most um, rewarding career. Thank you. Liz, I'm going to hand it off to you if you have additional questions. Um, I wanted to ask Allison, are there internship um, opportunities through the FBI in cyber and IT? So we, it's based on the needs of each field office. So for um, speaking on behalf of uh, my own field office, um, we actually, our, our cyber squad usually is the one that takes in um, interns. Um, so a lot of times people will come in and um, be at uh, computer science, cybersecurity, um, or a related degree of, of that nature that we're going to my cyber squad is already always, always uh, requests interns. Um, but, but of course, it depends on the uh, uh, needs of the various field offices. But you can have the so the cyber division up at headquarters would have internship opportunities okay. um, if you wanted to work solely in like the cyber division. Um, but you can also work in various other aspects as well. Um, and the internship po po um, posting will come out. Um, I would say September, October this year, mm -hmm. and it's for the summer of um, 2023. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, An, a long lead time. <laughs> Any, I think we kind of need to wrap wrap things up here. Does anyone, would anyone of the panelists like to make any parting suggestions, advice? You all have been remarked you're just amazing. Thank you. Allison, do you have your hand up? Um, yes. Uh, so I did see a question regarding um, dual citizenship. Mm. Um, so to, to, to join the FBI, you would have to renounce your other citizenship um, to go through the process. Um, so just keep that in mind um, for the background process. Um, and then also I saw someone mentioning um, a question regarding language opportunities. I do have my uh, foreign language um, program coordinator on the call, Vanessa Moore, um, and she she does the recruitment um, for like linguists. Um, so language is always needed at the FBI, um, and that, that that information can be found on FBIjobs.gov. And um, oh, um, Vanessa also posted down her um, her that email address as well if you want to contact for more information on that. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks and for I think Erica had her hand up too, Liz. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that if you're particularly interested in working for the federal government, um, 
I would encourage you to put up a profile on usajobs.gov. And I know um, that Allison mentioned FBI has one too. I don't know if it works the same way, but point being, I would encourage you to put up a profile. And you know, I think somebody put in the chat about how you can use keyword um, notifications. So if there's something in particular that you're interested in, a, um, a um, area, location that you're interested in being in, so on and so forth, you can attach all of that to your profile. Um, and it'll just keep you, you know, apprised of what's coming available and how long, how long the windows will be open, that sort of thing. Um, and if there is a federal agency that you're particularly interested in, um, for example, I know that NIH oftentimes will have jobs posted on the web, the website as well as, you know, the other um, institutes too will have some jobs posted on the website that may not be posted and USA jobs at the time. So if there is a, a agency that you're particularly interested in, you might want to check their website fairly regularly as well. But the profile on USA jobs, you know, that's that's pretty automatic and it'll, you know, you'll know when the rest of the world knows. Good. Jen, final words. Oh gosh, not final. <laughs> Just my final. Um, no, I would also recommend the same for, so for Booz Allen Hamilton, for example, and I'm sure other companies are the same, um, that you can set up a profile there okay. and, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, whether it's searching for open positions or just getting your information load it up so that it's um, easier to screen you for a recruiter to screen you. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a best practice if you're in this point where you're finishing your studies and, and kind of job hunting. So I, I would highly recommend that. Uh, Vanessa, welcome. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to uh, address the question that Mr. Martinez had. I'm Vanessa. Warren, I'm the Foreign Language Program Coordinator for the Norfolk FBI. And I wanted to just say that the FBI has a very robust foreign language program. Uh, the, um, and we fall under the Director of Intelligence. And uh, I put my information out there as for contact. Uh, we do hire uh, independent contractors as well as employees. So we do have several uh, information sessions that will be coming available April through September. So if you want to reach out to me, please feel free. I do a lot of screening of applicants. I talk to a lot of individuals that uh, want to come on board with our program and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Oh, that's okay. fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so students, if you missed something today, you can reach out to me or Dr. Yusuf. Um, and as Dr. Yusuf mentioned this, the recording of this, and I guess the chat transcript will be preserved in, um, at the Career Pathways page. So on uh, behalf of, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, we, in just a second, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm so indebted to all of you panelists for spending this much time and the very thoughtful uh, comments and great, great suggestions. And I wish I could give you all a mug. Um, anyway, next year, maybe we'll do something. I can give you a mug, but thank you so, so much. Um, go ahead, we. Yes, I do. Take us uh, out. On behalf of the Career Pathways Program, I, I do want to thank you for um, all your insights and the advice for our graduate students. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And to the graduate students in the room, as you've kind of heard about the specialized skills and these you know, KSAs, I want to encourage you to join us for our next Career Pathways Workshop, which is on transferable skills and inventorying your skills and how you communicate um, those skills. So um, keep an eye out for March 14th from noon to 1 p.m. for our transferable skills workshop um, targeted at, at graduate students. So thinking about what you do every day in the classroom, in your research, in your lab, and how you translate that um, into more specific skill sets rather than just, just saying, I do research. Um, so uh, March 14th, noon to 1 p.m. information is available on the Career Pathways website. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye.